Hello everyone and welcome to Art in Action, a series of online events looking at the relationship between literary authorship, literary celebrity and political activism. My name is Ruth Scobie and I'll be chairing today's panel, which is the very last in this series which has been running all the way through this very uh, weird lockdown summer. Uh, the series is convened by myself at the University of Oxford and by Sandra Mayer and Jenny Toya at the University of Vienna. If you're interested, I'd encourage you to check out the uh, links which will be appearing in the chat, which will take you to our website. And there you'll find videos of almost all the Art in Action uh, events so far, uh, ranging across periods to look at topics from Victorian radical poetry to contemporary Tamil fiction to contemporary literary celebrity and prize culture in Britain, as well as uh, some written interviews and reflections um, on these subjects by some um, of the most kind of prestigious and interesting people involved in uh, research and writing. Now today's panel we've given the title Authorship and Authority and it promises I think to draw together rather beautifully some of the themes that we've been returning to again and again or even just touching on briefly in previous sessions the public and private selves of the author, the relationship between aesthetics and politics, agency and ideological appropriation. Focusing this time on some major figures of late 19th and 20th century European culture. So all that's left for me to do at this point is to introduce our speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce all three of our speakers today. Uh, we'll hear from all of them and at the end of the papers We'll welcome your questions. So if you're interested, if you'd like to ask a question, please do feel very free indeed to add a question um, to the Zoom Q&A function. You can just type that in anytime during the papers, after the papers, whenever a question strikes you. And after they're finished, we'll discuss as many as we can. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, as our first speaker, Fotini Dimaruli an academic who works on English and modern Greek literature, often in comparison. Her upcoming monograph with Oxford University Press has the title, Authorising the Other, C.P. Kavafi in, in, in the English and American Literary Scene. And that examines the work of influential Anglophone writers who were pivotal to the rising international fame of Kavafi in the 20th century, which is something that you're gonna to touch on today. Fotini is also currently Outreach Fellow and Career Development Fellow at Keble College here in Oxford. Our second speaker is Margaret Scarborough, a PhD candidate in Italian and comparative literature at Columbia University, New York. Margaret holds a BA in European and Middle Eastern languages from the University of Oxford in Italian and Arabic, and a master's also, in, also from Oxford in medieval studies, a really wide ranging kind of academic career so far. Her dissertation, Our Unforeseen Selves, Living Hermeneutics, Italy, 1960 to 1990, examines the styles of existence of queer and feminist authors and activists in the late Cold War to offer an alternative domestic genealogy, genealogy for the contemporary intellectual tradition known as Italian thought. And finally, we're delighted to welcome Torre Rem. His most recent book is Ibsen, Scandinavia and the Making of a World Drama. Torre is also the general editor of the New Penguin uh, Classics Ibsen edition and is a professor of English language, uh, English language literature at the University of Oslo. He's published works on Dixon, uh, Dickens, Ibsen, book history, life writing and world literature, as well as several biographies of Norwegian writers. And he's also currently director of Ui, Ui U Nordic, a very large interdisciplinary research initiative on the Nordic region and cultures. So we're delighted to uh, welcome these three speakers um, and I'd like to just uh, invite uh, Fatini to uh, begin. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so hello everybody. Um, I hope my screen is shared now. Let me see, share. Okay. Good. So um, my my paper today is called um, "Can Dead Poets Speak Back?" and it concerns specifically uh, C.P. Kavafi and Cold War propaganda. 
Uh, so really, uh, the idea for this uh, paper came uh, from a broader question, uh, which had to do with me, um, uh, for me, with reception, and specifically um, the challenges for those of us who study, I think, reception is what happens to the voice of the original. Um, if meaning is partly produced uh, through interpretation and readings, and then does the artwork itself ever speak back, as it were? And if it does, uh, how exactly is this accomplished? Um, such matters become even more complex or even contested uh, when relationships of power are implicated in reception. For example, in cases where poetry is co-opted for nefarious causes, for propaganda, uh, or in more subjective terms, uh, to serve institutional politics we might disagree with. Uh, C.P. Kavafi's reception during the Cold War is just such a case. Um, C.P. Kavafi was an Alexandrian poet uh, writing in modern Greek, and he lived through the so-called golden era of Alexandrian cosmopolitanism, and today has entered um, the canon of world literature. So great authors of the 20th century Anglophone literary scenes wrote about and promoted him, bringing to the four different aspects of his work as these applied to their own projects, ranging from E.M. Force's liberal response to the fascist threat during the interwar period to James Merrill's poetic explorations on matters of stylistics and sexuality in the late 20th century. So an array of political affiliations became entangled with Kavafi's growing fame, unraveling roughly from the Bloomsbury group in England and all the way to the olden generation in America with a relatively consistent political coloring, which addressed at different times matters of marginality, non-heteronormative sexualities, the destructive nature of patriotism and of Western fantasies about the Eastern other. In the 60s and the 70s, numerous think pieces about Kavafi were published in the New York Review of Books. There, Kavafi became emblematic of the broader discursive climate associated with the New Left and with the anti-American Cold War critique articulated by thinkers such as Noam Chomsky and Hara Arendt. In other words, Kavafi decisively entered the world literary scene through the mediation of intellectuals and writers, broadly of the left and often gay, who associated the poet with socially progressive and counter-normative ideology. And this history continues to determine the way Kavafi is read today, for example, through the lenses of post-colonial and queer studies. And yet there is a different chapter of Kavafi's fate that has remained altogether unexamined. And this is his appropriation by anti-communist propagandists in the US and by the Greek dictatorship itself as a way to accrue political leg legitimacy. It is often the case that when we think of culture and authoritarianism, the first thing that comes to mind is censorship. So censorship, abhorrent as it is, often constitutes an act of rejection of a work we consider today worthy by the wrong actors. And in this sense, it can further affirm a work's value, at least for us today. But endorsement poses a different set of challenges. For example, when the ideologues of the Greek dictatorship, a regime largely reviled for its crassness and lack of sophistication, found Kavafi's poetry, a body of work both respected and cherished today, to be resonant with their cause. So Kavafi served a constellation of political agendas at the same time. On the one hand, he served the New York Review of Books anti-establishment directions. On the other, his poetry was rendered a vehicle for anti-communist propaganda in the New York Times. In Greece, he was endorsed by dissenting voices of the anti-dictatorial movement, but also by the Greek dictatorship itself for its right-wing wing agenda. I will briefly delve in this paper into these contrasting examples because they pertain to the larger research questions that frame uh, this work. And these are the following. Are, is there a uniquely authoritarian method to practice textual appropriation? Is there something unique about the way authoritarian regimes turn to poetry? And what do they do with it? And is this different to the way resistance employs poetry, for example? Uh, can poetics lend themselves to ideological embezzlement? In Kavafi's case, for example, are there features in Kavafi's poetry that may have facilitated his ideological tailoring? And thirdly, can poems ever speak back and resist uh, potential misuse? So could Kavafi's poetry speak back from within its content and internal structure? Uh, so um, I'm going to look at 
some examples in order to touch on those questions and I'm going to return to them in the course of the paper. The Greek dictatorship today, in order to give some context, is considered one of the darkest chapters in modern Greek history. The colonel seized power in 1967, capitalizing upon decades of political instability, the largely manufactured idea of an impeding communist threat, and a widespread sense that Greece was in a state of moral decline. The fourth anniversary of the coup in 1971 was marked by the publication of an authoritative statement of the regime's ideological program, the ideology of the revolution, ideals, um, not dogmas, and you can see here the cover of the tract. The publication came at a critical time for the dictatorship. While membership in NATO and American military aid had initially supported the regime as a bulwark, bulwark against communism, Greece was expelled from the Council of Europe in 1969 following the junta's human rights abuses. The writer of the ideology of the revolution, ex-communist propagandist and deputy prime minister during the junta, Georgios Georgalas, announced for the first time the dictatorship's enduring legitimacy as an ideologically driven revolutionary movement destined to protect Greece from a communist uprising. In detailing the dangers of the communist threat, Georgalas, who had been born and brought up in Egypt, turned to the Alexandrian poet Kavafi conflating the symbolism of two of his most popular poems, Walls and the Windows, to describe the communist tunnel vision and the shackles of communist ideology. I will present these two poems briefly uh, before moving on uh, to the excerpt from Yorgalas himself. So these are the two, the first poem by Kavafi called Walls describes somebody who feels hopeless because they've, they've been shut, uh, shut out from the outside world. And I think the crux of the poem really comes in the very last line uh, where it says, but I never heard the, heard the builders, not a sound, imperceptibly they have closed me off from the outside world. So it's a, it's a, it's a poem that plays on themes of entrapment and individual isolation. Another poem by Kavafi, also very popular, The Windows, is again about an individual who is entrapped and is trying to find a way out and cannot find windows outside of his enclosure or her enclosure. And again, the crooks comes in the final line of the poems, perhaps the light, uh, and perhaps it is better that I don't find them, the windows, perhaps the light will prove another tyranny. Who knows what new things it will expose. So both these poems put forward a sense of existential aporia, and they play on a spatial dichotomy of inside and outside to present a condition of perpetual entrapment. For the dictatorship ideologue Yorgalas, the enclosed, isolated individual of Kavafi's poems is a communist who is restricted by his very uh, own conviction. And I quote from the tract, the, dogmas, the dogmatist harbors the illusion that whatever he perceives constitutes the only and absolute truth. Through constant subtraction, he arrives at his own absolute view of the world. This is his dogma. Its follower ignores all other aspects of life. He views the world exclusively from his own point of view. He doesn't open any other window amongst the walls that surround him, which he has built and which close him off from the outside world. And this is a quote from Kavafi, of course. And he doesn't open any because, as the poet says, perhaps the light will prove another tyranny, since it would awaken him from the hedonistic self-deception that he exclusively owns the truth. So now I'd like to turn your attention to uh, the, um, the phrase, as the poet says. Not only does the use of the definite article rather than Kavafi's name, rely on Kavafi's widespread cultural resonance to make a point, but it also merges Kavafi's voice with that of Yorgalas. So Kavafi says, and Yorgalas explains. It is interesting that the final, li the final line is quoted, yet Kavafi's newest, nuanced commentary on the possi poss possible perpetual betrayal is erased. Communism is presented as a self-delusional prison from which there is a definitive, a definitive escape namely the truth capitalized of the dictatorship. And generally, Yorgalas capitalized notions such as truth and light to speak of the dictatorship as the ultimate solution to all of Greece's problems. It may seem that such brazen domestication is unique to authoritarian propaganda and unsuited to a more democratic setting. 
And yet, an even more blatant selective adjustment of Cavafy's poetry took place in the Foreign Affairs column of the New York Times just a year before the coup, at the height of the Cold War. In 1966, Cyrus Sulzberger, the prominent American journalist known for his covert cooperation with the CIA during the Cold War, appealed to the perennial symbolic popularity of Cavafy's barbarians to craft political content that overlapped with the junta's anti-communist discourse, albeit from beyond the borders of Greece. And the title um, uh, of the article that Sulzberger wrote uh, was, uh, was called The Bourgeois Barbari Barbarians. So now in the original poem, Wedding for the Barbarians, which many of you may know, Cavafy suggestively presents in a question and answer format a city's decline in an activity in the face of imminent invasion by a threatening other. The poem concludes with an ironic twist. The barbarians never arrive. But rather than offering relief, the news paralyzes the community, for dreams of salvation had been projected upon the arrival of the enemy. And the poem ends with a line, now what's going to ha happen to us without barbarians? Those people were a kind of solution. Now, in his article, Salzberger identifies the barbarians as the communists, whose role he initially treats as a blessing in disguise. And I quote, the great Greek poet Cavafy once inquired, and now what will become of us without barbarians? They were a kind of solution. For post-war Greece, the communists for a long time served the role of the Asian barbarians, a unifying menace. During a bloody insurrection, the rest of the country joined against them with a display of unity rare for Greece. The uprising was squashed, the Communist Party was banned, and that kind of solution is gone. Greece is now lapsing into its customary discord. Here we see the common practice of communist othering at play, in keeping with the rhetoric of post-war nationalism in Greece, where communists were considered to be outside the nation. What is more, Sulzberger's piece ends with an admonition. I haven't included that in the quote. And he ends with the admonition that the communists have in fact infiltrated the city's gates in disguise and are moving amongst, amongst quote, respectable friends. On a poetic level, both the idea of barbarians as instigators of unity and as infiltrators are misrepresentations of Kavafi's content. Sulzberger here works not only through erasure, but through creation of new content that is loosely based on the poem to disseminate the intended message. For this purpose, Sulzberger in this piece divests the poem from its open-endedness to illustrate a condition of emergency. The, the barbarians have arrived and they're amongst us. And resists Kavafi's tentative treatment of the binary between citizen and barbarian. In Kavafi's poem, the barbarians turn out to be something better than villains, and the citizens something worse than victims. Written just one year before the coup in Greece, the New York Times opened, carved out an ideological space in implicit support of any political act that would drag Greece out of its, quote, customary discord, uh, which made it vulnerable to communist presence. Notably, the colonels, and especially the regime's initial leader, dictator Georgios Papadopoulos, would resort to the very same reasoning in presenting the coup as a revolutionary act. In this sense, Kavafi's poetry in the writings of Jorgalas and Sulzberger worked as a transnational symbolic landscape of ideological cohesion. Jorgalas embedded Kavafi in Cold War anti-communist rhetoric, rather than just domestic politics while Sulzberger drew the Greek case closer to American interests by utilizing the insider voice of a Greek poet for the dissemination of his anti-communist message. There is no doubt, of course, that both Jorgalas and Sulzberger were capitalizing upon Kavafi's pre-existing pre symbolic authority, while creating it anew through the poet's addition to the ideological territories. This redeployment of shared cultural symbols and narratives is after all commonplace in propaganda. Relying on the past means that there is no need to craft new stories, but mere, merely to tell old ones in new ways. But there is also something particular, but is there also something particular to Kavafi's poetic features beyond his well-established popularity and authority that made these selections, partial interpretations and content manipulation viable? 
like walls in the windows, Kavafi's waiting for the barbarians sets up binaries between us and them, inside and outside, self and other, and these are amenable to the vilification of any presumed enemy. Structured upon a territorial metaphor, bereft of geographical or historical specificity, um, uh, the waiting for the barbarians perhaps serves Sulberger's divisive portrayal of the communists as an existential threat to Greek civilization. A portrayal that in turn enabled him to craft an exclusionary notion of Greek national identity that served the agenda of the Cold War. Kavafi's dichotomies and binaries appear to lend themselves, at least to some extent, to elective adjustment. Which, which amounts here to presenting two sides of the ideological spectrum and then siding with one of them. Amidst this all, however, Kavafi was also employed as the voice of dissent against the dictatorship in Greece. His work occupied center stage in 18 texts, the prime joint act of intellectual resistance against the dictatorship, published in 1970 by prominent Greek intellectuals and writers. Uh, this collected volume is considered a milestone in anti-dictatorial discourse and has been monumentalized as the most subversive textual event in modern Greek history. It has also been translated in many different languages. In Dimitris Maronitis' essay, Arrogance and Intoxication, Kavafi's poem Darius is invested with undertones of resistance. In an inversion of Yorgalas's rhetoric, about the dictatorship's capacity to liberate from the delusional enclosure of communism, Maronitis likens the dictatorship to a prison and turns to Gaddafi in his quest for a symbolic language to speak of these conditions. In the context of Gaddafi's dictatorial afterlife, Maronitis' essay reads as a response not only to the dictatorship's rep repressions, but also, perhaps unwittingly, to the place that Kavafi symbolically deserves outside the prison of the colonel's propaganda, or even as an intellectual weapon against it. It should be noted that opposite Maronitis stood not only the dictatorship's propaganda, but also pro-dictatorial scholars who read Kavafi in ways that dovetailed with the goals of the regime. And now to return to the initial question, how do we distingu distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate appropriation? Even as it may be tempting, largely on emotional grounds, to speak of misappropriation and misreading or distortion when it comes to politics one finds distasteful, there are some issues with employing those terms a priori without qualifying them on a textual basis. So if we are to engage with the textualities of reception as well as their potential repercussions, it somehow seems necessary to assess whether appropriative methods are illegitimate in themselves rather than consider them as such because of the a legitimacy of the politics of the ends. So how do we evaluate the mechanics of poetic engagement vis-a-vis -vis the politics? Now, Shima Sini in the Redress of Poetry wrote about uh, the place of poetry in a world of political action and what it means for poetic writing to both resist and address it. And I quote from Shima Sini, poetic fictions, the dream of alternative worlds, enable governments and revolutionaries as well. It's just that governments and revolutionaries would compel society to take on the shape of their imagining, whereas poets are typically more concerned to conjure with their own and their readers' sense of what is possible or desirable or indeed imaginable. Sorry. Now, Heaney was sympathetic to poetry that would meet the needs of the field of force of political activism, but warned uh, that a balanced tipping could be affected when, quote, engaged parties expected poetry to be an exercise of leverage on behalf of their point of view, the entire weight of the thing to come down on their side of the scales, unquote. In such a case, poetry is valued less for its, quote, distinctly linguistic means and more for its immediate function, and is therefore at risk of losing its, quote, artistic integrity. Now, what is arresting about Kavafi's use in, uh, on, the, on the resistance side in 18 texts is that there is an intersection between politics and scholarship. So other than conveying a didactic message, which it does, the text is also attentive to Kavafi's poet protagonist, the complexity of, then the complexities of his situation, his confrontations with power, and also the emotional journey he undergoes. 
Uh, Maronitis is a philologist, and he unpicks the poem's la layered nature with the incisiveness of an invested reader rather than the force of a politician. Rather than setting the poem directly to the surface, surface of a particular reality, he roughly maps out a contemporary situation upon Kavafi's artistic imagining of some equivalent labyrinth. I think that it is on grounds of this breathing space which is created firstly on a formal level, the poem's analysis is separated from the more politically oriented part of the text. And secondly, on a reader participation level, the poem is presented in relevance to the reader's situation and not as an abstraction, and not merely on value judgments pertaining to the nature of the politics themselves, that Maronitis' essay does justice to the artistic integrity of Kavafi's poem in a way that other propagandistic texts do not. Maronitis himself explained the reasoning behind his selection of Kavafi's poem. He said, in this instance, we need poems that do not deliberately belong to so-called engaged poetry, so as not to come up against just or unjust prejudices. Moreover, we need poems whose identity is known and easily perceived by all. Finally, our very recent poetry cannot be deciphered without violent and hasty, hasty gestures and it is useful to avoid this here. It is the same reasoning that must have to some extent underpinned all of the appropriations examined here. Kavafi became immersed in the tensions and conflicts of a political moment, for he was a famous dead poet of unknown political convictions. He therefore could not speak and did not belong, and was perhaps infinitely malleable precisely because he could not speak and he did not belong. And yet there is still the poetry. Returning to the initial question, is it possible for the work itself to resist its many adaptations? I would say that since politics are open to contestation and potential readings are infinite, it falls on textual criticism to test not merely the legitimacy of a political claim, but also how much of the poetry in fact survives after the leverage, as uh, Seamus Heaney calls it, that burdens reception uh, has been exercised. Uh, thank you very much. So this is the end of my paper. And I would now like to pass on to Margaret, who is going to present her paper called Socrates Goes to the Moon. Hi, thank you, Fotini, and uh, thank you, Sandra, and the other organizers of Art in Action for the opportunity to be here with you. My gratitude also to Torch for hosting the event. Um, Today I'm going to present a little bit of my research. Um, I'm, some of it will be somewhat simplified. So I hope that doesn't cause any problems. Um, as I prepared for today, I couldn't help but think that Pasolini, the Italian intellectual poet and filmmaker, had he been in my shoes, would have had something to say about Zoom as a medium. And he would have also had something to say about the format of our discussion, an academic seminar in which we speak frontally to an audience we cannot see. He considered television worse than the atomic bomb. It bothered him that viewers were anonymous. He thought this established a relationship of inequality between speaker and viewer, from superior to inferior. These webinars can hardly be considered a media event. I don't think so, at least. I hope not. Um, and Zoom is in television. But it is interesting to think about how Zoom alters or reproduces existing discursive modalities and power relations. Here, I also note that Pasolini despised academic conferences for the same reason, for the hierarchy they created or implied between the bearers of knowledge and knowledge's recipients, for the fact that they confirmed his authority rather than undermine it. He was interested, above all, in horizontal relationships. Um, I don't want to make any assumptions about how well you know Pasolini, who is very, very easily caricatured, um, but I will give you a bit of biographical background. He was a Marxist and an out homosexual in conservative Catholic Italy. He grew up under Mussolini, established himself as a prolific poet, novelist, and critic in the post-war, and received attention at home and abroad as a film director in the 1960s and 70s with scandalous films such as Terry and Salo. In the 60s, like many other leftists of his generation, he became an increasingly outspoken critic of consumerism and other societal changes he blamed on the global spread of capital. In 1975, he was brutally murdered at the age of 53. In some respects, the title of my paper is a misnomer. 
Pasolini was always democratic in the sense that he was always egalitarian. But I have become curious in the specific emphasis he places on democracy starting in the mid 1960s when, unsurprisingly, he also begins to link his name to that of Socrates, the Greek philosopher we associate with truth, self-knowledge, dialogue, and questioning. Before becoming a film director, Pasolini had considered himself only a lyric poet, or primarily a lyric poet, a Rambeau. A devotee of Antonio Gramsci, however, he also viewed himself as a committed organic intellectual. Gramsci's intellectual, you might recall, should actively participate in practical affairs and try to foster the new spirit of the working class. Pasolini embraced this role very heartily. In 1960, he started contributing regularly to the Italian Communist Party Weekly. In his column called Dialogues with Pasolini, readers wrote in with questions about literature, Marxism, and current events. In his responses, Pasolini challenged readers to rethink his status as a figure of authority. In 1964, for example, he apologized for having been too official, saying he no longer wanted to have authority or take part in the myth of authority readers were looking for. He didn't want to rest on his laurels either. Authority couldn't be stockpiled, he wrote, but had to be constantly renewed in actual scenarios. He admitted also that he had a tendency to get on his high horse and asked readers as a corrective to treat him more democratically, that is, to help him cultivate what he called his democratic nature. Pasolini repeats this move over and over and over again in other articles and interviews. So in the 1960s, Pasolini had become convinced that Italy, which was coming to the end of uh, what's called the economic miracle, so this period of um, post-war economic boom, had been unified by mass media and industrialization, consumer culture, and goods. As a result, Italians were becoming all alike, all middle class, and were all thinking the same middle class thoughts and speaking the same language for the first time before they had spoken many dialects, which they continue to speak, but Italian was standardized for the first time. And because Italian as a language contributed to this national standardization, he toyed with abandoning Italian as an act of resistance, making films, which he thought allowed direct, unmediated access to reality, was one way of doing this. He cut his ties with organized Marxism, which he considered to not understand the nature of the changes afoot in Italian society, and moved towards the radical left and his larger radical against what he termed dehumanization or the loss of singularity and reflective capacity of individuals. Although I should say he remains allegiant to the Communist Party um, as his preferred choice. He, he moves to the left, but he's, he's still in favor of um, communism. Uh, Socrates comes into this picture in a big way in 1966 when Pasolini falls ill with an ulcer. In his sick bed, he rereads the dialogues of Plato and almost overnight adopts a Socratic persona, recrafting himself as an intellectual willing to renounce his life for the sake of truth and the life of the polis. So I'm gonna show you a clip, um, which I hope can give you an idea of this kind of Socratic uh, persona that Pasolini adopts in this period. And it's from a 1966 film. Senti immediatamente il dovere di non essere arrabbiato ma rivoluzionario. Ed essere rivoluzionario in questo momento in Italia significa eh, assumere un'altra forma di moralismo. Sono anche i comunisti rivoluzionari italiani in questo momento. Sono tutto sommato ancora di, di borghesi o di piccoli borghesi in doppio petto che anziché avere le loro spalle a rassicurarli i dogmi del cattolicesimo, del conformismo borghese, hanno i dogmi dell'ideologia marxista. Questo in generale, naturalmente, ci sono dei casi. Ecco perché il mio tipo di rabbia non catalogabile si presenta in realtà come uno dei casi di rabbia in Italia. Ora vorrei aggiungere che per me l'arrabbiato ideale il meraviglioso arrabbiato della, della tradizione storica è Socrate. E non credo che non ci sia caso di rabbia più, più sublime di questo. E, e, e tuttavia la società ateniese era a suo modo sublime. 
c'erano comunque questo Stei Meleto che accusavano ingiustamente Socrate in nome del conformismo del tempo. Eh, Socrate ha risposto a tutto questo, in quel modo che si sa, eh, senza tuttavia essere un rivoluzionario, ma rendendo semplicemente quello che oggi non era uno stagione che andava in giro da una palestra all'altra di Atene, alla periferia di Atene. Um, so, another interview, Pasolini explains the distinction he's made here between being angry, arrabbiato, and being revolutionary. The angry or enraged person can system within the system with the goal of modifying it so that it can survive, while the revolutionary tries to overthrow the existing system only to end by reproducing it. That's what he calls this moralism of um, certain revolutionary sectors of Italian society. For Pasolini, Socrates is exemplary because he acts to save the institution of democracy itself. The enraged person, I quote, does not come to his senses, get bored, or learn his lesson, but is like litmus paper. That's Pasolini. She is someone who reacts while respecting the law. Pasolini also identifies with Socrates for other reasons. In a rant against television, for example, he writes that poor old Boerfoot Socrates with his dirty tunic would have called TV an exercise in mythology or the hatred of reason. He upholds Socrates as a model libertine and homosexual too, making the case that his love of young boys or pederasty was the very basis of Socrates' vocation as a teacher. An autobiographical poem clarifies how Pasolini's definition of political commitment changes via this identification. Socrates is a historical figure who lives his ideas in constant dialogue with others and in the visibility of the form. A commitment modeled on Socrates becomes something that cannot be achieved through writing alone, but has to be lived as total action. And I quote, though a poet, I want only to live because life expresses itself only with itself. I would like to express myself with examples, throw my body into the struggle. But if the actions of life are expressive, expression is also action. So we can see that Pasolini's understanding of this total action in turn transforms his conception of poetry. I quote, the actions of life will be only communicated and these will be poetry since, I repeat, there is no other poetry than real action, end quote. This commitment, really the conflation of action and poetry, which Pasolini describes as two modes of action or two sides of the same coin, takes several forms. Pasolini dedicates himself to making difficult films that will force viewers to think critically rather than entertain them. That's one way of acting or one way he chooses to act. He experiments with theater, which he envisions as a venue for reproducing the public form of Athens, of creating an experience of democracy as a collective and small scale activity based in dialogue and debate. Um, and he, he considered theater, the choice of theater is very specific, a form of struggle against mass culture, an anachronism in that it could not be mass produced and did not peddle to mass interest. The plays he writes are aimed at fostering the exchange of opinions and ideas and creating a critical rapport between spectators and actors, with ideas as their protagonists and a mix of bourgeois elite and working class as their target audiences. His plays, I'm sorry to say, were a massive flop. In the same period, Pasolini becomes a very staunch advocate of independent cultural activities, such as local literary prizes, deeming them exercises in democracy. He similarly argues for the reform of the Venice Film Festival in 1968, arguing that the jury should be autonomous and made up only of artists, free of external political and financial interests. He increases his participation in roundtables and debates, as well as his journalistic activities to bring his ideas to publics beyond the left wing. So he starts writing for really um, more centrist newspapers. In 1971, he collaborates with the leftist group Lota Continua on a film project to polemicize the 1969 bombing of Piazza Fontana. The shadow of Socrates, I would like to think, haunts these activities. And we can see this, or we can see the constant identification with Socrates um, also through some of his planned projects. 
1968 interview, Pasolini said he wanted his last film to be about the life of Socrates. The film would signal that he had achieved a pure and disinterested relationship with his public. The story of this last unmade film is complex. The life of Socrates ostensibly morphed into an autobiographical and more allegorical screenplay. The Socratic protagonist was replaced by a figure more similar to that of Greek poet Constantine Cavafy, uh, whom Fotini has just discussed in her wonderful paper. Um, and Pasolini, it's, it's important to stress here, had identified with and emulated Cavafy from start of his career, especially when he was a very young man. Um, and his decision to return to Kabafi, a poet, as his preferred persona or alter ego, rather than Socrates, the philosopher coincides with his growing sense that he was still, at the end of the day, above all a lyric poet, and that poetry was still the most oppositional activity available to him, but it was still a form of action and of living as action, of expression as action, in a quote that I shared from the poem. So when Pasolini died, um, and even he was working on the screenplay uh, before his death even, he intended to stop making films altogether and devote himself exclusively to writing. So this self-portrait as a Socratic Kavafi individual was really going to be the culmination of his uh, cinematic career. So the moon of my title um, is also a little bit of a misnomer, um, but it refers obliquely to this last screenplay, um, to a motif of a space race that starts coming up um, throughout Pasolini's career, if you recall the moon landing in 1969. Um, and in this last screenplay, the comic protagonist, accompanied by his sidekick, goes in search of a utopian vision and travels through the history and violence of the 20th century in search of a meaning that can redeem the world. He fails in his quest and returns to the cosmos, where he can, from an attached vantage point, survey the earth and his past experience, appreciating that life has given him a journey in pursuit of truth. Pasolini's early death prevented his desired return to poetry as action, but it was seen in Socratic terms of fitting death. That is, Pasolini felt um, that he was living in pursuit of truth. Should you be interested in learning more about the Socratic Cavafy Pasolini personage, Abel Ferrara's 2014 film, Pasolini, incorporates autobiographical materials, including scenes from the last screenplay, Porno Teo Colosso, to depict an angry, committed author who practiced what he preached, a portrait of the late and last very political democratic Pasolini. Um, I leave the stage now to Torre and his paper on author Knut Hamsun. Thank you. Hello there. Um, and uh, many thanks to the organizers for uh, facilitating this conversation. And thanks for turning up. I have little more than a case study to share with you today but it may throw some light on or open up a few issues related to the role of writers, the relationship between aesthetics and politics, and hopefully the ongoing discussion of this seminar series. It comes from Nordic, and more particularly Norwegian literary history, and it regards the career and the poetics broadly understood of the novelist Knut Hamsun. Let it suffice to say that Hamsun is often considered a pioneer of literary modernism, mostly due to Hunger, 1890, but also to other works of the fantasy echo, such as Mysteries and Pan. Hamsun soon acquired European fame and achieved huge popularity, particularly in Germany and Russia. After the turn of the century, there is a marked change in his writing, however towards a more conventional, epic, and realist style. For one of the novels in this vein, Growth of the Soil, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1920. His career is characterized by rupture, however, in that he, in April 1940, chose to side with the Nazi occupants of his own country and with the Quislings. His notoriety peaked 
I'd argue, when in 1943 he visited both Goebbels and Adolf Hitler. And when, not least, on the 7th of May 1945, astonishingly, he wrote a glowing obituary of Hitler. A case study then, but perhaps primarily a study of literary authority gone wrong. To simplify somewhat, I would argue that two radically different views on the role of the artist played themselves out in the life and career of Hampson. Both ideals of how, or how a writer should act and behave, both with implications for politics and the public sphere. They appeared in chronological order, and the gateway between one and the other, as I understand it, was nationalism. One way of approaching Hamson's career and his great fall as a writer during and after World War II would, of course, be through politics. Hamson developed a reactionary form of politics before World War I, and at the same time, a strong allegiance to Germany, combined with equally strong antipathies towards Britain. He soon became disillusioned with uh, parliamentary democracy, started admiring Europe's strong leaders, and drifted towards and then into Nazism. Another approach, and one that in our context might be more fruitful, is to investigate this writer's authorial role, however, briefly. I'll continue in narrative fashion. At the age of 29, in the early autumn of 1888, an unknown Norwegian turned up in Copenhagen, set on making his own way. He was an autodidact with a total of 252 days of schooling, but had tried to write since his early teenage years. Along the way, he'd ended up doing manual work of different kinds and had traveled restlessly, most recently during his second two year long spell in America. He was despairing, he had brought a manuscript and he went to the top. On 17th of September, he wrote to Edvard Brandes, the influential brother of the leading critic of the so-called modern breakthrough in Scandinavia, Georg Brandes. He was concerned. The latter critic, he worried, had argued that a writer first had to make it in his own nation before he could achieve anything in literary terms in the larger world. The book I'm working on is so desperately un-Norwegian, he noted. I had not wanted to write for Norwegians. He informed Edward Brandes that he had traveled from the age of 14 at home and abroad. How national can you then be at the age of 30? Later that autumn, this unnational writer created a literary sensation in Scandinavia with the publication of a fragment called Hunger, a story. It was published anonymously but it did not take long before the press got his identity right. And when Hunger appeared in book form in 1890, it had the author's name on the cover. He had originally wanted to publish the text, an anti-novel, anonymously, Hamson insisted, but his publisher had refused. His idea when writing, and this was something he had wanted to continue with, was to, quote, turn up anonymously, unexpectedly, with sudden effect. In short, to reject outward authority. Knut Hansen arrived in a literature that was experiencing its heyday. Out of next to nothing, a Norwegian, and more generally, Scandinavian literature had become the concern and interest of Europe. My co-author Narva Fulsos and I have called it the Scandinavian moment in world literature. Hansen, however, immediately presented his outright rejection of the literature of the 1870s and early 1880s. Most famously, the novelist went on the attack in a series of lectures given in Christiania, now Oslo, in the autumn of 1891. There, Hamsen rejected, among other things, the social art associated with the previous generations. 
in what must have been the climax of this lecture series. On the 7th of October, the recently de-exiled Ibsen turned up and found his seat in the front row uh, next to Edmund Gig. Hamsun did not hold back. I will be as much on the attack, as destructive this evening as possible, he began. He needed space for something new, he continued, something for which there was no room in the narrow, in quotation marks, world famous Norwegian literature. Norwegians had been fooled by the Germans into thinking that Ibsen was a writer of unfathomable depths, he claimed, whereas he had done nothing but to create characters and types. The genre of drama, more generally, did not provide for the complex and nuanced portrayals of the modern human psyche that were necessary. Thompson's rebellion uh, was, of course, a classic instance of what Pierre Bourdieu describes as one of the key mechanisms of the literary field, that of generational conflict. And it worked. Thompson distinguished himself as a representative of the new and young, even in fact, inspiring Ibsen to thematize this conflict when he wrote about the young generation knocking at the door in the master builder the following year. The rest, as the saying may go, is literary history. But it's literary history of a particularly revealing kind in our context. Literary history that can be used to reflect upon the role of the author, the relationship between aesthetics, celebrity, and politics, and on the basis of cultural authority and the writer's responsibility in relation to nationhood. Ibsen's generation of uh, Norwegian authors profited from and contributed to a strong sense of national progress in the last decades of the 19th century. The extraordinary position Ibsen achieved in his home market evokes the, the remarks of Franz Kafka on the advantages of writing in a small peripheral language. Among the general benefits of literature, Kafka mentions the pride which a nation gains from a literature of its own and the support it is afforded in the face of a hostile surrounding world and the acknowledgement of literary events as objects of political solicitude. Comparing the large German literature with the small Yiddish and Czech ones, Kafka noted that such effects could also be produced by relatively restricted literatures. In small nations, there would certainly be fewer experts in literary history, but literature would be less a concern of literary history than of the people. Quote, what in great literature goes on down below constituting a not indispensable cellar of the structure, here takes place in the full light of day. What is there a matter of passing interest for a few? Here absorbs everyone no less than a matter of life and death. This then seems to have been true of Norway in the last few decades of the 19th century. Norwegian writers who spent time abroad reported on how the interest in literature in the large nations was nowhere near that of their home culture. But in the 1890s, the decade in which the term poetocracy came to be used in and about Norway, Hansen consistently kept on satirizing the position and role of his nation's authors. In a lecture called Against the Overestimation of writers and writing from 1897, he ridiculed our modern worship of writers. It was all humbug, he noted, and expressed his disbelief at this unreasonable overestimation of his colleagues. It seemed like, the, like a pest, he concluded, claiming that writers ought to be approached as vagabonds and wanderers, not as authorities. As late as 1910, the German critic Karl Morburger, Hamsun's first biographer, identified the investment in the role of the author as one of the most conspicuous features of the Norwegian literary field. Quote, there is no country in the world in which such a cult surrounds the writers and art. Unquote. The idea that writers were leaders 
had been attacked with exceeding vehemence by Hamza, Morburga concluded. But well before this time, which was also the year of Björnsson's death, Björnsson and Björnsson, uh, something in Hansen's approach had begun to change. It was in 1899, in connection with a stay in neighboring Finland, a country in which Hansen recognized clear parallels to his own country's struggle for independence, that he had begun to re-articulate or adjust his position. He still spoke about the importance of being free from societal pressures and of complete artistic autonomy. But now, just as his own nation also moved towards independence and his nation's artists played vital roles, he made room for an exception. The love of their fatherland was slumbering in the masses, Hamza noted in a lecture, and it was an urgent task to wake it up. The writer, he continued, knew what a true sense of nationhood was and was able to articulate it, quote, with such words, that you will never forget it for your entire life." Unquote. Perhaps, Hamson ventured to guess, a less pessimistic age might again make room for, quote, the writer as patriot. When Björnson died in 1910, Hamson was 50 years old. The need for a new literary leader was soon enough expressed, and Hamson hesitatingly and ambivalently let himself be flattered and anointed. He would ironically call himself leader after Björnson. Around the same time, he published his first prophet-like statements on politics, not least on the need to turn back to the soil. Motivated, among other things, by the needs of the nation, as he saw it, in an attempt to stop more emigration to America. The taking up of the new authorial role coincided with a, a reactionary, anti-modern turn in Hudson's politics. At the same time, he seems to have been more, become more receptive to folkish ideas, associating Germany with youth and England with decrepit old age, as well as seeing a special role for Norway within the Nordic and even the Germanic spheres. Then came the Nobel Prize, which took the author's fame to new levels. In Germany, he was both popular and extremely influential for a great number of writers, including, in fact, many who would soon become emigre writers. But more importantly, Hamsen had become a truth sayer, and particularly in questions that had to do with the perceptions of his own nation. The new level of fame helped make him into even more of a prophet, incorrigible. I'm coming to a close. Björnstein Björnsson was a nationalist and at the same time a small state internationalist. As to his taking on the task of speaking on behalf of his people and nation, he seems to have inherited his role from the romantic poet Henrik Wergeler. Hamsun did the same, but with disastrous consequences. And he never repented. It was for Norway that I wrote, he noted, after the war was over. Those who now pass judgment on him had never heard, quote, the godly voice of the fatherland in their souls, unquote. He would have done it again. Hansen stayed true to the exception that he had outlined in Finland in 1899. Um, it gave, he believed that it gave him access to the very authority that he had mocked and rejected so fiercely, this particular understanding of the nation. Finally, there's a particularly fascinating postscript to Hansen's literary destiny. After the war, Norwegian authorities were struggling with how to deal with their most famous writer. This ended, to cut a longish story short, with a psychiatric investigation that concluded in a diagnosis permanently reduced mental abilities. Four years after the end of the war, Hamsun responded by way of literature, namely the memoir on overgrown paths from 1949. In this work, he in part returned to a fragmented, subjective and famously indeterminate, wavering style, um, 
but now in the voice of an aged, frail man. The text focuses on details rather than the big picture. It revolves around aesthetics rather than politics. It approaches literary fame from a distance, stressing how most things belong to the past and even the distant past. It's something of a stoical masterpiece, one that creates identification with and sympathy for the persecuted writer, the great man resigned to his fate. In a hundred years, all is forgotten, Hansen famously writes. All is nothingness, nothing really matters. The work was clearly part factional, part fictional, and it has tended to charm and persuade its readers. The reception then and later, I would claim, makes it into a biographical intervention in a writer's reputation. Not only did Hansen prove that his mental abilities were not reduced, he seems to have convinced many readers that he had done nothing wrong. I can't go into the many ways in which this text possibly addresses and plays around with literary authority, but I'd like to mention at the very end here one way in which Hansen seemingly revises his past. This happens in the subtle allusion to an earlier meeting between a great writer and a great politician in Erfurt in Germany in 1808, quote from On Overgrown Paths. Napoleon appeared before Goethe. Did a bolt shoot through the world at that moment? No. The two men spoke, but Napoleon had but little time. When he came out again, he is supposed to have said in acknowledgement of Goethe, what a man. That was all. It were as if they had never met. But they too, dead. Hansen doesn't explicitly mention his own encounter with Hitler, but that is, of course, the well-known subtext, at least in the book's first reception. The comparison had, in fact, been made as soon as the unsuccessful meeting was over on the 26th of June, 1943. Hansen, however, wrote one of Goebbels's people, deserved more praise than Goethe, who, after all, behaved like a subordinate royal servant. Hansen had fearlessly or stubbornly confident in his own cultural authority, confronted Hitler. He had spoken, as he saw it, on behalf of his own nation. Hans's indirect or covert description of this meeting may tell us something about his own retrospective engage, uh, perspective on the event, as well as of his views on the relationship between art and politics and on the role of the artist. In the disgraced, if still world famous novelist's account, it was Napoleon who presented himself to Goethe, not the other way around. It was the artist who gracefully received the politician, not vice versa. Art in Hansen's vision remained above politics and the artist retained a privileged position as the unique subjectivity that was above the law, as an authority who did not have his equal in the realm of politics. Thank you, and back to Ruth. Hi, thank you all very much for those papers. That was fascinating. Um, we have about 15 minutes now for questions, so um, I'd really invite people in the audience to put your questions into the Q&A um, if you've got any questions. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to kind of take chair's privilege just waiting for Photonita. Hey, there we are. Cool. So, um, so the first thing I was going to ask about, um, the, the, the term that I kind of, I kept wanting to fit in here was, was partly just thinking about celebrity. Um, and I was thinking particularly about like this in the first two papers, particularly, I guess, but it, it was coming into to the third as well. Like there's this, central concept in celebrity studies that says kind of the central experience of celebrity is that someone else, other people shape your self, your public self. You have a celebrity self, which kind of goes off into the world and is kind of con uncontrollable by you. Um, and it struck me for quite a long time that that's essentially that question about celebrity and agency is, is very similar, or at least sort of looks on the surface, very similar to the problem of kind of reception of, the death of the author and that worry that you kind of like send a book out into the world and what what its reception is and how it's interpreted 
and how it's used is out of your is kind of fundamentally out of your control. Um, so that's just me rambling, but I wonder if I could ask about that question about celebrity, about specifically about the fame of these authors, um, sort of almost separate from their their writing. Is that something that you could kind of any of you could speak to? Uh, um... Maybe I could, yeah. Um, okay. I've been thinking about exactly the same question uh, for a while, specifically because I look quite a lot into Cavafy, and Cavafy was known to have this persona that was invested with mystique. And many of the readings of his personality happened in correspondence to the poetry. So there was a lot of mythology about what he was like with very sparse evidence. So it was mostly like witness accounts. But then that evidence, sparse as it was, was combined with the poems and there was an interpretation of who Cavafy was. And what I found particularly interesting is in this is that there is, I, f I think there is no way to actually derive factual information so much uh, as there is to concoct a fictional narrative mm -hmm. that does help us, that does help in understanding how the poems themselves have been read. So I think that the narrative of the poet's persona or the figure is part of the reading of the work. It's a parallel narrative, but I think they can be looked at together. I would be very hesitant generally to take any of those fictions about them, the author and the subject at face value, as it were. But I think they're very valuable as a topic of study. As a topic of study, as a way to study reception, I think they're extremely valuable as long as they're not taken at face value as factual evidence necessarily. Sure, I mean, just because they're not true, don't mean doesn't mean they're not real. They're not yeah. exactly, or they're not like a, a, a very a, a very interesting way to look at an author because the way we imagine authors does contribute to our reading of literature, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Even if we believe in the death of the author and we like to think of the work, you know, we're always going to go on Wikipedia and search, oh, you know, were they married or what did they do? You know, all these, all these facts on the side that for some reason they fascinate us because most people tend to be interested in other people. Uh, so I just, I think it's, it's as simple as that, really. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, even if, people, if the author is anonymous, that in itself has a kind of, or if we don't know very much about the writer, that that mystique kind of seems important to, to Kavafi in particular and to other people. Yeah, and like Thomas Pynchon is another good example. People are fascinated by Thomas Pynchon to a large extent because he, you know, he's never appeared. So that mm. idea of disappearance also kind of intersects with the way people approach the work, which is so much about disappearance. Uh, yeah, so. Which is, again, at least on a very kind of, surface level not dissimilar to the way that um certain kind of critics value ambiguity in a work right like a, a mysterious or a kind of reinterpretable work kind of works in the same way it invites further investigation it invites speculation yeah. mm. sorry Tori, you were gonna you know, no i mean it's just i think uh, clearly biography is a sort of one of many historical contexts that can be uh, productive uh, and interesting in, in uh, interpretation as well. But um, when it comes to Hamsun, um, and I could have said a lot more about the celebrity because, um, you know, the, the kind of trajectory that I've tried to, to uh, talk about now is, you know, moving from this, to me, quite exemplary um, a position in which he refuses, rejects external authority and actually wants to be anonymous to taking on external outward authority uh, and and that happens you know that happens through fame you know that, that happens through celebrity culture at least partly uh, but I think it, I'm sure there are lots of different sort of negotiations in 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 relation to that I think Hamson can sort of be blamed for investing in it you know I think others have fame thrown upon them Famously, um, but um, but he 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 really invested it. He became sort of obsessed with his own name. I mean, he even started sort of court cases against his um, brothers who used the same name because because he had invented it. You know? um, so uh, and then and then comes the appropriation. Uh, and in Hamsun's case, in Germany in particular, it's huge. It's the name, and it's even the farm that he buys. That that becomes you know the most famous author's home, really. In, in Scandinavian literature. So, um, yes, it, it sort of 
almost on a line with the Nazi appropriations of Hamsun. You know, I, I would argue that Hamsun does not write, he doesn't write a Nazi novel. There is no Nazi novel in Hamsun's oeuvre. You know, the, the texts are too complex for that. But he sort of lets himself be appropriated. So he becomes the favorite writer of most of the leading Nazis. Goebbels, you know, it, it, no other author is referred to more often in Goebbels' diaries than Knut Hamsun. So, and he never, he never sort of resisted that. Uh, so, you know, that's just another, another part of appropriation. And, and uh, so, you know, there wasn't a mystique. I, I wouldn't call it mystique in his case. No, but certainly that concern with, with personal fame, mm. or with a kind of personal authority. Mm. Sure. Um, Margaret, did you have anything you wanted yeah. to add? I, do. I mean, it's a huge topic. Pasolini is was in his lifetime uh, already, you know, one of the most famous, uh, recognizable figures, both in Italy on the domestic scene and internationally. Once he started making films, and he, I mean, I tried to gesture to it in my paper that he has a very contentious relationship to his own celebrity. Um, which was also, uh, especially in the Italian context, um, very, he was a very polemical figure. Um, and, and a lot of it had to do with biography. So he was um, persecuted uh, for his homosexuality, um, accused of you know, indecency against minors. He was thrown, I mean, he was in numerous court cases. There's a lot of scholarship on that, uh, always protecting or his writing, uh, his writings against accusations of, you know, indecency as well, moral indecency. So he, he occupies um, this position of, of a celebrity that is an infamous celebrity, as it were. Um, and it's only actually sort of after his death I think, that he becomes really um, uh, well loved um, or He's still very contentious and um, controversial, but the, he often says, uh, or in his lifetime, that this problem of authority, that is that his fame means that, that anyone who is famous will have this authority and kind of cast upon them, um, which is something that he says he tries to ignore. But I mean, you can see even in this video, you see through the course of, he, he occupies a moment also when, uh, when, when on television. I mean, he is a filmmaker. He's in the in a, he's in a visual realm. So, um, and he cultivates his image. So that that clip I showed with the glasses, Pasolini always looks like that. You know, from <laughs> he doesn't change really, and he becomes very very iconic. Um, I do, and I actually think um, that in his case and. Um, he was trying to push the need actually for biography uh, to be read into work. So um, uh, his work is heavily autobiographical. He never shies away from that. Um, mm. His writings will refer to his life experiences and um, his, his journalistic writings too are always you know, positioned from his person. So it's, uh, it, I mean, I think scholarship has maybe become too biographical in some respects, with, but uh, I think he, he was countering the death of the author in a very real way. The point was he had to live um, what he wrote and vice versa. Mm. I, I was just interested in one thing in, in, in relation to biography. Uh, in Fotenis, uh, um paper I and mean, you talked about how literature may resist appropriations but I, I suppose you could argue that biography and whatever historical context can also resist uh, appropriations uh, and that you know the cases will be very different there um, you sort of answered because I, I was going to ask that and then you and then you said well you know he is a mystical figure there's very little you know about his opinions but in other cases you would think that you know these appropriations can be resisted by referring to what you know the writer's actual political position or what the writer said and his poetics and so on so you know that clearly that yes there are different kinds of appropriations there 
I was thinking about it when I was speaking before exactly that point that where do I stand when it comes to authors who have quite a clearly stated political agenda, right? Yeah. I think that that's in, that for, with Kavaf, it's convenient what I say because we don't know much about even his political sure. beliefs. But when you have somebody who's an activist who's very actively involved, then I think the conversation changes a bit. But then again, we're, yeah, I guess, I guess we are talking about the individual in their relation to politics. We're not really talking about celebrity though, are we? I think that's a question that it's the, it is biographical in a sense, but it's mostly, it's a positioning in the world, right? So it wouldn't strictly be tethered to celebrity unless the author was also heading an activist movement, in which case it would be connected to celebrity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, celebrity is such a, difficult thing to it's like nailing jelly to a wall but that that sense of like a connection between the reader and the, the writer that, that that's that he's someone you know or that you could create that that sense okay. yeah i mean the question of course always is like if you if you discovered somewhere a, a letter signed by kabafi that said kind of like marxism i think it's wonderful everything i've done has been kind of mm. in support of that does that change like does that mean that these interpretations no longer um but, yeah. yeah, but again, I think the relationship is quite, you know, different in different cases. I mean, I yeah. think it's Tomaszewski who says there are writers with biography and writers without biography. Um, and of course, that, uh, that's more about the way of writing. So, you know, if you have a very autobiographical writer, then I think that investment in celebrity means something different from uh, someone who, whose works are clearly more removed from his actual life, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering whether these are all writers who are in some ways trying to control that and to sort of in some ways present themselves as writers kind of without biography in some cases or with biography. Like there, there's a certain sense in which the works are shaped by a, an awareness of that mm. and an attempt to kind of control reception, um, whether that's the reception at the time or, or kind of posthumous ideas of fame as well. Um, we do have a question in the, uh, in the Q and A from uh, Peter McDonald, um, who is saying all the talks raise questions about the authority of authors, how that's conceptualized and made. So I think that's kind of one of the the things that's linked to this worry about kind of how, will I be misunderstood? Will I be will my my self kind of overwhelm the work, or can the self support the work? So how? Uh, how is the authority of authors conceptualized and made on the one hand and the authority of writing on the other? Against this background, I'd be interested to hear what the speakers have to say about writing that interferes with the markers of authority. So it was something that was clearly important to Pasolini or raises questions about its own authority. And perhaps following on from that, how this might affect how we think about reception. So that's a kind of a multi-layered question, but this question about um, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about genre and form and, you know, do some, do some forms have more authority than others or do some forms present themselves as having more authority than others? I bet, mm. Difficult. <laughs> it's a, of course, it's a difficult question. I mean, it's, uh, and this is something uh, uh, Peter McDonald knows well, but I mean, this line from uh, Diary of a Bad Year, we could see, uh, you know, learn to speak mm -hmm. without authority, which, which comes from Kierkegaard. Um, and I think, you know, there's clearly something text internal there as well. And in Humpson's case, if I may, you know, continue to speak about him, uh, that work, Hunger, clearly does something text, that, you know, internal. It's not just that it wants to be anonymous, um, but it's also that the text clearly destabilizes meaning and destabilizes authority. Uh, it explicitly, you know, rebels against authority uh, in you know, long rants from this uh, unknown hero, um, uh, protagonist, um, uh, but it also in terms of free and direct discourse, almost stream of consciousness like, you know, techniques uh, uh, does the same. So I'd say there's, you know, it, it's both on in that particular case. So it's, it's, a, it's a general sort of resistance against um, authority and, a, and a sort of an attempt at letting the text, at letting the novel or anti-novel, you know, he, he actually did not want it to be called a novel. Um, again, again, another 
you know, resistance against mm -hmm. authority. You know? So, you know, I, I think, yeah, yeah, it's going on many, on many levels in that particular case. Yeah. Do either of the other two want to hop in? I, I was again. I, it just sparked another question. It's real. It's maybe it's real. It's related to what you said just now, Ruth. Um, uh, the authority, say, the authority of the genre. I was just wondering again, Max Platania, about uh, it's. You know, you raise quite you know big questions about um, uh, uniquely authoritarian tropes or literary appropriations and so on. And and your case is poetry. Would you say that it's genre specific what we talked about? Because I mean, to me, it seems you know the poet, um, perhaps the classic. Uh, it seems to me that that's you know part of the reason why Kamafi is is you know usable uh, more than the genre as such. Or or would you query that? Um, I'm trying. I'm I'm trying to collect my thoughts on this. So I think when it comes specifically, in a way. Um, Again, this pertains to the specific example. Kavafi was not in any way anti-authoritarian, at least not explicitly so. He didn't speak to authority or against authority. In many ways, he was, uh, you know, he talked a lot about Christianity. He was, in many ways, he was status quo. Um, uh, however, his poetry has been widely perceived as speaking against authority. So James Merrill says Kavafi is counter-canonical. Um, Ian Forster says Kavafi is an example of how we can combat the fascist threat and look at the small man and uh, stop thinking about great men and heroes. So there's a clear anti-authoritarian direction. That is what Peter MacDonald also mentioned, this idea of being made and of mm -hmm. reception, where Kavafi is being made into a major anti-authoritarian figure. And that's why I find his appropriation by authority very interesting, because so far in my book, I had only come into contact with the first part of this. And only now am I coming into contact with the second part of it, which is authority figures, actually um, looking at Kavafi as a celebrity figure and thinking, what can we take from that? But there must be something there to take. And what is interesting is seeing, uh, but because I believe that Kavafi's poetry is, in essence, anti-authoritarian authoritarian in, in the form itself, what you mentioned, Tore. If you look at the form itself, at the narrative, at the, um, at the betrayed expectations, at the ironic twists, that in itself is a mode. And that's why I insist on textuality, because I think, I think that internally there is something deeply anti-authoritarian about Kavafi. But, uh, but until you look at that more specifically, I think, by and large, he's perceived as such because he's been made to be as such. Mm -hmm. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? That does make mm -hmm. sense. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, Margaret, did you want to uh, uh, jump in? Yeah, sure. Uh, I will. The, I mean, one thing that's interesting um, in Pasolini's case is that he also considers speaking writing, right? So, um, and, and even the way he speaks in interviews and so forth. So he's, he's, what is writing for Pasolini is extremely broad um, because he starts to view language as essentially all action, like everything is language. Um, you know, your cup or uh, our bookshelves are, you know, have an expressive capacity for Pasolini. Um, but the he does, uh, especially after, so from the mid 60s onwards, start to build um, a kind of anti authoritarian approach into his text. At the same time, he's controlling the reception of the text in a very pronounced way. He's a very, very um, big user or constructor of paratext, so paratextual apparatuses around all of his texts. He will write introductions, um, prefaces, sort of appendices, I mean numerous things over and expand kind of the, the shell of a text to explain, you know, his motivations and reasons. Um, 
but or also to contextualize uh, work. So he'll say, you know, like I thought this at the time. I don't think this anymore. Um, and one way, I mean, besides the form, Pasolini was incredibly prolific. So it's hard to. Um, there was a lot that wasn't published in his lifetime. A lot that was. Um, he wrote thousands and thousands of pages. But the one way he kind of countered or undermined his own authority was by starting to publish unfinished works. So in his own lifetime, he would um, publish texts that were uh, incomplete um, and show them in their incompletion. Um, and uh, when he died, his and he when he died, he had started writing texts in a way as found texts. So texts that kind of perform the fact that they will have a reception, um, being composed of fragments, uh, even, um, you know, documents describing, you know, um, he said they should be, they should be like a historical archive, like a novel, his famous novel Petrolio uh, was like a historical archive. So he, if part of that is he starts to invite the reader um, very explicitly to take part in the construction of the work. Um, and it's, uh, um, it's, it's, yeah, so I would say that he, he, he very much engages the reader in the creation of meaning, um, which is, is one way to look at that question. Mm -hmm. No, that's brilliant. Okay, we are, I'm afraid, uh, out of time. So we're going to have to draw this to a close, even though I would love to keep having this conversation here a lot longer. Um, I just now need to say thank you to all three of you for your papers today, which have been really wonderful, really a great way genuinely to, to finish this series and, and to draw these questions together and to open out loads of new ones, which is kind of the <laughs> frustrating thing because there's more to talk about. Um, so thank you very much for three fascinating papers. Um, I'd also just like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers from the series um, for your contributions, which have been fabulous, but also for the way that everyone reacted when we had to co cancel the conference back in March, um, which was a horrible decision, which inconvenienced a lot of people. Um, but the, the kind of generosity and the kindness and the understanding of everybody involved really made a huge difference, um, as did everyone's enthusiasm and willingness to reschedule and to deliver papers from all over the world, <laughs> like in the middle of what has been a very difficult time for a lot of people. So thank you all very much indeed. Um, reorganising the, conf the conference into these webinars was also made possible by the continued support of our funders. So I'd just like to say thank you now to uh, the Austrian Science Fund, Postcolonial Writers Make Worlds, the Stephen Spender Trust, and of course, particularly Torch, um, who have been our, our gracious hosts throughout. Um, but most importantly, um, as most of you will know, this has all been a, this has all happened from the very beginning and the reorganization because uh, of the completely ridiculous amount of work that has been done by Sandra Mayer. Um, the, the literally hundreds of emails that she's done and the just continued determination to make these conversations happen. Um, with the invaluable, always super cool and super professional help of Jenny Toyer um, at the University of Vienna. So I was just gonna like try and persuade them to come on camera at the end just to like take a little bow. There they are <laughs> together. So um, genuinely, thank you so much for your work, you guys. And uh, a round of applause, even though we can't do real round of applause. Thank you for letting me be, me be part of this project and giving me the chance to meet so many brilliant people, like the three panelists of this panel. And yeah, thank you for everyone for making this such an easy job. It really was. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone who's participated in the series knows that if there haven't been any major hiccups or embarrassments, it's really all Jenny's doing. Um, it's <laughs> no and drag her in front of the curtain or usually sort of uh, in, in front of the bushes, behind the bushes yeah. and uh, to take credit for her in, in incredible work. I mean, when we, when we started this project, we didn't quite know what we were letting ourselves in for and uh, really the kind of nitty gritty detailed work that goes into the behind the scenes stuff. And uh, Jenny has been very calmly and composedly maneuvering us through this entire project. And uh, I can only chime in with what Ruth has said. 
Um, we are immensely grateful to Torch. Um, I should say that Torch has been an important place for both me and Ruth. I mean, first of all, it's really, they've given us a virtual home to have these conversations in. And uh, also on a personal note, it's been an important place. Um, I mean, first of all, it brought Ruth and me together many years ago. So they're brilliant matchmakers, I should, I should say. <laughs> um, and also they were the ones to give a platform to celebrity research when lots of people, especially senior colleagues, were still giving you very strange looks when you told them that you were working about the history of celebrity. So I think Ruth knows exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. And so I can only say it's been an enormous pleasure to organize this conference and this webinar series with someone like Ruth. And I'm enormously grateful to her for bearing with me um, at a time that I know has been enormously challenging and difficult. Um, days that I know were filled for her with eight hours plus of you know, back to back Zoom okay. teaching. Um, so that's just been an enormous joy and uh, I can only recommend working with someone who's not only a brilliant scholar, a wonderful colleague, but also a great friend. I'm going to switch your camera off if you keep it on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So <laughs> once again, thank you to everyone involved. Thank you to uh, audiences and for your questions. And thank you particularly to Peter McDonald, actually, who's been uh, tremendously supportive throughout. Um, so with that, we will uh, let you all go and then um, have a great weekend. And uh, bye hope bye. to meet everybody in person soon. Mm. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.